Hi everyone, uh, Dave here. Thanks for coming along to another episode of Legends of the Spire. Now, on the podcast this week, we have our second manager. Uh, we had Nicky Law on a few months ago, and uh, that was really great to have him on. Um, and we're following that up with John Duncan. Now, John needs no introduction, really, uh, but he'll get one anyway. Um, he was He's had two spells in charge of Chesterfield. Uh, in his first spell in the 1980s, we won the league title in just his second season in charge. And then when he came back in the 1990s, uh, we got promoted via the playoffs at Wembley uh, against Bury. That also included a very epic semi-final against Mansfield that everyone remembers very, very well. Uh, he was then obviously also the manager that took us to the FA Cup semi-final in 1997. Um, so with the 25-year anniversary coming up, it was great to get his memories uh, and recollections of that time. Um, the glasses flying when Jamie Hewitt scored that last-minute equaliser. Um, what memories. Uh, it's not something that happens every day. So to speak to John Duncan about it was really, really special. Um, as always, we are at Spire Legends on Twitter, Legends of the Spire on Facebook, and now also Spire Legends on Instagram too. Um, so please do like, share, subscribe, whatever you can do, on um, whichever way you either watch or listen to it. Um, Any way you can spread the news is really appreciated. Um, so without further ado, let's start the episode. Here we are with the legendary John Duncan on Legends of the Spire. So can I ask you first about your playing career? Because probably most Chesterfield fans think about you as your manager, managerial career, but you scored a lot of goals, didn't you, for Dundee and, and Spurs, teams like that? Yeah, yeah. I had a good goal-scoring record, yeah, and I managed to take it with me when I moved down to Spurs, which was a big move at the time, obviously, from Dundee, and uh, enjoyed it there and uh, managed to keep scoring, as you say. Yeah. What what type of player were, were you? What, what were your skills and attributes? Well, goal-scoring was my main thing. I mean, it became kind of at that time and the teammates, everybody, you know, the... Spurs especially were uh, had, had good goal scorers on the Greaves and whatnot. Um, so somebody that scored goals was something that they wanted their striker to do. Uh, and it, before long, whereas in Scotland I was trying to maybe be more of a an all-round player, it was important that I got goals. Uh, and it became... You really, my lifeblood, that's what got me in the team. That's what kept me in the team. And uh, I was pleased. I got a few injuries and unfortunately at the wrong times. But when I was playing, I managed to, to keep a, a decent goal scoring record up. Mm. Was that quite an easy transition for you then going from Scotland to? Um, it wasn't easy, no. I mean, I was up totally in awe when I came from Dundee to Spurs. I mean, the Paid 130 or 40 grand for me, and I'm thinking to myself, I'll do well. I get in the, the first team here, but when you pay that kind of money, you're in the first team right away. Yeah. And it did take me a little bit. Different type of play, I had to be quicker in my brain and alert and time on the ball. Uh, and it took me a wee while, although, even although when I wasn't, wasn't quite got up to grips with it, I managed to nick quite a few goals while that was happening and eventually I did manage to get uh, into it after a, a few months and uh, that was fine. And so you were playing with people like Glenn Hoddle and people like that, were you then in your... Yeah, I played when Hoddle came into the team and before that I played with Martin Peters, World Cup winner, uh, Pat Jennings, uh, Mike England, Phil Beale, Martin Chivers, Ralph Coates, you know, Steve Perryman, these types of players. Just over a quarter of an hour of the second half gone now. Still Manchester United leading uh, by a goal to nil. Of it. 
turning well and putting it wide of Stepney into the corner. Spurs one, Manchester United one. What about your goal? Um, I was uh, very happy to get one. I had a few efforts that just didn't go in, and I was thinking my day wasn't going to be my day, but I managed to get that one. It's been a marvellous season for you, though, hasn't it? Can yeah, you put that down to anything in particular? Not really. I feel I've, I've got over injuries, which I had a problem at the beginning of the season, and uh, the breaks have been going with me. So. Was going into management something that you wanted to do from quite early? Was that ever in your mind? Well, yeah, I got qualified as a coach when I was quite young. Well, I was still at Dundee, actually. Um, I'd been to PE college and, you know, seen the, watched the coaching going on. And I felt, yeah, let me get myself qualified to be a coach, which I did. And uh, that was when I was about 22. I got fully qualified as a coach in Scotland. I didn't do the English one until I was uh, just turned 30. But, yeah, I was always thinking about the coaching side of things. Yeah. So then your first kind of coaching job, was that Scunthorpe? First? Yeah. And you were still... I did kind of my contract was up, and I applied for the player manager's job. Um, and I got it. I don't think because I don't think there was too many people wanted it, that, that job, but... Uh, <laughs> And I didn't actually play much. My injuries were too much for me, Achilles tendon and my back. But, uh, yeah, that was my first managerial job. Obviously, my first season, I mean, I'd, I had some of my ideas that I thought, but really when it came to practice, these ideas were were, were a waste of time. You only only really picked up the the ways and ways of managing and working things out once I was in the job. So my first season was a bit of a disaster, but it was a great learning experience for me. And uh, fortunately, I kept my job after uh, a really bad year. Um, but then the next year, what I'd learned and the way that I went about it, we ended up at the top of the league around Christmas. Mm -hmm. um, in the top three, uh, you know, nearly all the time. But for, unfortunately, I lost my job. So when I was at the bottom of the league, I kept my job. When I was at the top of the league, I got the sack, you know? So it was a strange uh, feeling at that time. Management's not changed then. <laughs> <laughs> Funny things happen, don't they, in management? Crikey. Um, so was it, was it tough going from playing with, like, World Cup winners to then managing players that were obviously not at that level was it was it different like that or not definitely that first season was such a shock to me and uh, um, hugely different trying to manage and to play and really the, all you thought you'd learn as a coach and as a player really was of little consequence it's, it's it was, management's like totally different to being a player uh, and that's why I'm um, when you hear these pundits on the telly and their players who haven't managed or coached I think it's a big drawback to them in their, in their knowledge of the game and what they can impart to the viewers because it's just a and I think most managers would say the same what did you what did you know about managing before you became a manager and the answer is zero um, and you've just got to build it up from there so your potential blueprint of how to be a manager was kind of chucked in the bin. Absolutely. <laughs> Absolutely. I can remember one of my one of my thoughts where as a player that you know you've got to be together, which is fair enough, but you've got to be sympathetic to players, you've got to be able to help them to maybe their their their, their family life as well as their um playing and 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 really be what would you say helpful to them outside the game as well and that would be beneficial to them as players but that just worked out opposite to me you know I went in there and you know if they wanted a day off to go to the doctor or they wanted a day off because the kid was a, had the flu you know that type of thing I would I would go along with that um, but we're at the bottom of the league uh, and I didn't see much benefit to it. So the next season I decided, look, no, 
first football's first for these guys. If they they're signed contracts with Scunthorpe, we're starting at ten o'clock. You gotta be there. There's no excuses. Pretty much no excuses. Um, people coming and asking for days off, and I'd say no. Where I would have said yes. And lo and behold, we're at the top of the league. So um, I started to feel that that was more the method that uh, you should use, which wasn't me as a person, but it's what I learned was the right way to go about it. Yeah, absolutely. And, and you ended up at Chesterfield, didn't you, by a, mm. by a Hartlepool? Yeah. The choice of either staying at Hartlepool or coming to Chesterfield? I did, yeah. Uh, when I left Scuntop, I got a Hartlepool job, which was, you know, they were pretty dire, but and, and, and as a team, but I really enjoyed it. We started to build something there, and it was quite promising for the next year. I felt, but I couldn't turn down the approach from Chesterfield. I didn't. They, they, they'd well, they'd just been taken over by Mike Watson and um, Barry Hubbard, and uh, I knew them as a club. Been living in Duffield, not that far away. Not that not didn't know them that well, but I could see what what their potential was, and I I couldn't refuse it, so I moved. Yeah, what what did they say to you to um to convince you to take the job? Well, I had an interview with uh, Mike Watterson. Um, I mean, I wanted the job. It was just whether I was going to be the candidate to to get it. Mm. I think Emlyn Hughes was was right in there as well. Uh, and Mike Waters interviewed me. We were in the station hotel. And he said, you know, what's your position? And I said, well, look, I've just been to to Burnley for a interview. Uh, and I thought I did pretty well and going well with them there. Uh, and I've come to yourself and chatting away to you. Um, and he says, all right, then. He says... Um, if you were offered both the Chesterfield job and the Burnley job, which one would you take? And I thought, oh boy, he's put me on the spot here, hasn't he? <laughs> so I thought about it for 10 seconds and said, I'd take the Burnley job. And he says, oh, right, you've got this one. <laughs> <laughs> and that's, that's exactly the way it went. <laughs> and what were your first impressions of the club? Yeah, progressive. It was a new start, wasn't it? It was a new board, new owners. Um, the club had done really well, hadn't it, with the Scottish, the Anglo-Scottish, mm-hmm. but financially it had got itself in trouble and the whole thing changed around um, and it was, talk was positive, but unfortunately we only had six players, so really to be feeling too positive about how the performance was going to be was 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 really not not logical but we did okay yeah and i was going to actually ask <laughs> kind of what you thought of the squad of players when you first came in so you didn't really have one there were six and three of them were kids <laughs> um i think paul gregory gary bellamy uh I think they were the two first team players or possible first team players that were left. Mm. So I had to get signing players right away. Yeah. So but I did know the division and I did know the players around at the time. So it was difficult, but it, we got it done. Yeah. So were the players straight away that you were like, those are the ones that I need to sign? Um, pretty much. I, I brought Steve Baines with me from Scunthorpe. Uh, which was a uh, a good move. Eventually, I took um, Les Hunter as well. They they'd taken they'd been successful for me at Scunthorpe and yeah. managed to get these two as centre backs, which I thought was, you know, if we've got these two, I'm I'm going to be all right. Uh, and then yes, just brought in a few others from around, and Alan Birch came. I didn't know a great deal about him, but he came and uh, we did well to sign him um, and he gave us a lift as well. Hmm. So first season was kind of uh, 13th, I think, first season? Yeah, not bad really, you know, considering the big changes, everybody wanted to win every game, of course, Hmm. Um, but I thought it was a reasonable 
start and did give me the, the basis of what, where I wanted to go and uh, get get the kind of, what would you say, the, the main structure of the team in place and just just bring in a few extra at the time and hopefully away we'd go. And then obviously second season. Mm. So we've had it with a few managers at Chesterfield where they've won the league in, a, in the second season. Yeah. Um, you know, how... How do you how do you go from coming kind of mid table and then building it into a into a title winning team? What's what's the key things that you do? I think that year, if I'm right, I didn't actually sign any players in the summer. I'd kind of got them all during that previous season, either on loan and transferred them into uh, into full contracts. So I got them settled. We were a settled team, and we knew pretty much what the best team was and, you know, maybe the two or three backup players that were around it at the time. And, um, yeah, that was a big help. We, we just went straight into the next season um, with players who, who'd got to know one another, uh, got to know the strengths of the, the team and uh, away we went. And I, I suppose when you've got that squad already built, then it gives you the pre-season to actually concentrate on working with them, doesn't it, rather than signing a whole new bunch of players? That's right. These days, there's a huge change round at the end of every season. Yeah. We, we had our change round during the previous season, yeah. What were, your, what were your pre-seasons like? Did the players enjoy them? <laughs> I don't think they did, but I did. I, liked, I enjoyed seeing them running up and down these hills. Um, we brought in a... Coach, uh, uh, athlete, athletics coach John Tivy from Derby Rugby Club, and he helped us a lot on our planning with that. And we really did get them fit. That was a big, big thing. You know, we needed to. You got, you got to match the other team for legs in the first place. Mm. Yeah, I remember when we had um, Sean O'Neill on the podcast. He was saying that he he thought he was fit before he came to Chesterfield, but then he. He realised he wasn't that fit. <laughs> so. Well, he was at Chesterfield, but he may—he thought he was fit until he joined in the train with, with me. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sean's a good player. I mean, he, he'd taken over the social club and really had kind of gone part time. But uh, I thought, no, I need him. So he, he actually changed back to full time for the for the championship season. Yeah, yeah. It was interesting. He was talking about that, saying that. He didn't really know what you what you thought of him, with him also running the social club at the same time. It's uh, it's an odd thing, isn't it? <laughs> well, he didn't he didn't know what I thought of him. No. <laughs> oh, well, he did well, okay. Off. He did okay. He, yeah, he had, well, Sean was a good player, but you had to keep on on top of him. I always felt. Yeah. So, so I mentioned at the start a bit about training. A lot of players have talked about you know the turn up in the morning and be like, right, where are we training today? And it was kind of a case of going out and finding somewhere where you could train, wasn't it, every day? Definitely. Uh, we, this, we tried the Chesterfield School, but we couldn't always get there. So we were driving around looking for a patch of, patch of land um, and nicked on there before every time I kick us off <laughs> <laughs> and do what we had to do. Um, regularly, didn't know what where we were training when we got in the cars to, you know, changed in the cars at Solidgate to go and look. Mm. And a, a few players I've spoken to have actually said that that kind of helped with the togetherness of the squad. That's yeah, that. because it's a bit of a laugh, wasn't it? And we're all trying to make the best of it. And um, and it did, yeah. Uh, you know, you're okay. You're not, you don't feel like you're at Real Madrid, do you? But uh, <laughs> it did seem to have a bonding effect, which we took through. Yeah. Yeah. Cristiano Ronaldo doesn't have to pick up dog muck, does he? <laughs> well, yeah, that's, I was, yeah, I'm glad you raised that. I was going to, but yeah, there was quite a bit of that on some of the pitches that we trained on. Yeah. Crikey. So what was, so how did you want to build a team to, to win a title? What were your, what were your fundamentals of being a manager? Um, I think, you know, once I'd, got over the shock of the first season at Scunthorpe and built it up. I felt that you got to be fit. you got to get your, 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 your set play organisation. 
uh, sorted so that if you over a season scored more goals at free kicks and corners than you conceded, you're on a plus. Hmm. And if you're fitter or as fit as the fittest team in the league, you're also on a plus. So I had to get, I was determined to get that bit right, first of all. So, um, and along with the set play organisation, um, there was, there was, we needed a kind of a shape that people could recognise and players knew their roles in it. And we developed that. Uh, most teams played 4 4 2 at that time, and um, we did pretty much. And everybody knew pretty, again, there was odd changes. Somebody sometimes played a winger further forward with Phil Brown to make it a 4 3 3. Um, but our best team was when it was a 4 4 2. And um, we worked on that, and everybody knew what they had to do, and everybody knew what everybody else's job was as well. So um, that was important. Also, defensively, we would never, never get done in behind. Nobody could get done in behind. Um, and up front, if there was a chance to get the ball in the box, we would never turn away from it. Um, you know, they were the they were the principles that we would would use. And so many players have talked about how they all knew when they were playing where everyone was going and mm. what everyone was going to do. So there was players that were new to um, following shots from certain players and uh, where people were going to go in, in plays and stuff like that. I suppose that's just being repetitive and well-drilled, isn't it? Well, I say it repetitive practice. Um, Kev, Kev Randall was with me, although he, he was... Um physio but he did a bit of the training you know he, he he could he could you know get a good get a good um team shape done in a in a way that was enjoyable it wasn't just standing around although we did have to concentrate on the shape of the team for quite a, quite a lot of the time in training mm. yeah and you mentioned um Kevin Randall um it was obviously uh with you all, all the time what do you have those kind of discussions in the office about about kind of uh, you know previous matches what's coming up and, and stuff like that and things that you kind of uh, kind of bounce off each other when you're a management team um, of course we're, talk, we're talking all the time about what we can do to improve or discuss really the team selection team training you know, or you know, you know, whether are we looking ahead to the next six games or look the, just take this one as it comes, which was usually the case. Mm. And um, he was excellent. We didn't think differently either. We, you know, we don't, didn't think exactly the same about the game, but we had with very um, similar thoughts on it. And also, would although you wouldn't have thought so, our management experience and coaching was similar. He he got into management. Uh, off the back of coaching at York and had a short spell there in a tough, tough environment. And I had the same at uh, Scunthorpe. So we both had got over the shock of becoming a manager rather than a player uh, and were able to use the, those experiences to, to help the team. And in that, that title winning season, how, how much do you get to actually enjoy winning the title when you're the manager and how much is it like right next season <laughs> how long how long do you actually have to enjoy it oh it's week to week isn't it I mean I mean we were up we were up there but then we also um, did we yeah we had a little spell where I think there was five of us going for four places or four four of us going for three places and there was a period it was looking like we were going to be the fourth you know, the one just, just missing out. Mm. Um, but we just kept sticking to our guns. We had Ernie and um, Bob Newton up front who, and Phil Walker as well uh, shared, shared the two positions. Uh, and we managed to get enough service to them to get, to get them scoring goals. Um, but yeah, that, that, that was, that's the way we went about it. And, 
we were looking, like I say, maybe ending up fifth. And we're this week where we had to go to Hereford, who were in up top, away from home, on the Tuesday night. And then we had to go to Darlington, who were also above us, away from home on the Saturday. So, you know, most people are thinking we're in big trouble here. But we won both those games and that, that was it. And we, you know, we really steamed, steamrolled it from there. Hmm. Was that the point then that you thought, yeah, we can yeah. do this? Yeah, we'll beat both of those. Uh, away from home, great games, both of them. Uh, and I knew the, the team had the mentality and the ability to be able to do it. Uh, yeah. And, and those next two seasons after we've been promoted, obviously held our own in the, in the league book. Just about didn't, I didn't feel, I mean, there was a cut, I made it, I felt there was a few instances where I got things wrong there. Um. The team had to change too much, but you know the people who had been good in the fourth weren't always able weren't able to do it quite so successfully in the in the third. That's what as they were called at that time. Um, right through, Chris Marples was fantastic in the fourth. Um, he, I mean, he had his cricket career as well. He, he didn't do so well the next season. Baines and Hunter found it a big struggle. In the in the next league at that time, whether it, for whatever reason, Sean was finishing. I made a big mistake in letting John Matthews go. He was a real good midfield player that I didn't quite appreciate at the time. Um, Ernie was finishing. Bob Newton moved. It was we were in a real transition. So as much as we survived it, it was really backs to the wall. For a couple of seasons, is it is it tough when you've got those players that have done so well in one season, and then you kind of have a com- have to have a, a conversation or have to kind of replace them? Is I suppose it's the reality of it, but it's, it must be. Of course, you know you've got your your bankers. I mean, Marples, Baines, Hunter, O'Neill uh, were bankers. Another the other one was um, Brian Ferguson, right back. So it was Ferguson. Baines, Hunter and um, O'Neill and Brian Ferguson got a bad injury before the season started so the five at the back all had to change mm. um, centre backs played occasionally in and there and, and, you know, but never actually got as dominant as they were Yeah and so during that first spell as Chesterfield manager which players did you really enjoy working with? Well, that whole whole squad were absolutely different class, but they were, what would you say? They called it the goodies and the baddies. There was a, there was a kind of a split there, and we had the kind of a, what would you say the, the serious, the, you know, the, the 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 typical professional and hardworking like Ernie, fantastic and. Uh, quite a few others on the, on the same lines and then there was the group who were just a little bit you know wanted to have a good time and um, but were all good players as well mm. in fact Steve Kendall who was probably the best player you know touch brain ability uh, as anybody in that team and uh but he was in that that group where you know, we weren't rebels. They just needed needed to be controlled. But it wasn't easy to control them. You had to <laughs> let them go off their own, their own way and pull them back together. And to be fair, they did well. Um, so that was the, a, a big contrast in that team for that season. They just gelled brilliantly. But it didn't continue the next year. Is that where? kind of teaching experience come, comes in handy because you're having to teach them, treat them almost like a classroom. <laughs> well, no, I, I can't say that. No, it was, I mean, it was just, it was really taught me all about all the facets of management, that that, that team and different things to to handle and and yet keep them playing and was and, and keep them, and they were all, they were good players. Uh, as I said, Kendall, Fergie, Newt, you know, real good good players. There's no doubt about it. Um, 
and uh, it was great to see them when they were performing like these two games at Hereford and Darlington, they really came to the fore and produced it. Yeah. Can you enjoy it from the sidelines when, when they're playing that well? No. Match? <laughs> no. Well, that you only enjoy it for about five minutes after you've won the match. That's about <laughs> it. And then you had obviously a spell at Ipswich, didn't you? And, and then mm-hmm. a spell as a teacher as well before coming back to Chesterfield. Mm-hmm. What was was that kind of too good too good to turn down going to Ipswich? Of course, we, we, we really just feel the, the finances had gone. Um, the team was really struggling. In fact, Kevin Randall took over from me, from me, and he did a remarkable job keeping them up again. Um, so yeah, when Ipswich came along, you know there wasn't too much thought needed on that. Yeah. Yeah, and and then like I said, you had a spell, didn't you, as a teacher before you came back as back to Chesterfield? Didn't you? Well, yeah, uh, I got a sack at Ipswich, and yeah, I taught for a couple of years actually, because I qualified as a PE teacher way back, uh, and that was my first job about twenty years after I qualified. Hmm. <laughs> was it was it nice to have a break from football, or were you itching to get back in? No, it was good break to start with. I was I'd. I'd I'd had enough at Ipswich as well. I'd just got on top of me. Uh, all those solid years I'd done, what, f- solid from 81 to to 90, absolute solid management. And um, I mean, it wasn't like easy going. It was tough, tough job, both, all of them. So I really did need a break. But after a year or two, it was maybe 18 months, I was starting to think about it again, and when the Chesterfield one uh, cropped up, yeah, uh, I thought, like, we'll give it a go again. So I guess you jumped at the chance then, did you, when Chesterfield kind of appeared? Well, well, yeah, I mean, I was I was really enjoyed the teaching, and I was considering going back to Scotland as well, but when it cropped up, I thought, look, yeah, i got to go again, you know, and just proof to myself that I can do this and hmm. let's see where we go. Yeah. And had it had the club changed at all or was it all pretty similar? No, it was a big change, wasn't it? Norton Lee was running it, um, completely different, although Barry Hubbard was still there, which was good, and he, uh, I worked well with Barry, thought a lot of him, and um, the club was not dissimilar, was needing, needing a big, big change, needing a big, big overturn of players. Um, which we managed to, to take on and it was similar to the last time with kind of mediocre first season but uh, did the business the second one I think if I recall Chesterfield know they have much to do to get themselves in the frame for the playoffs but they started well enough here when Nicky Law's header put them one up after 13 minutes and David Moss found himself with time and space to line up the volley that made it two apiece Fact not lost on the goalkeeper, you'll notice. Then in injury time, one point turned to three. The faintest touch from Andy Morris, but enough for the man they call Bruno to deliver the knockout punch. Chesterfield three, Chillingham two. And here again is the happy Chesterfield manager, John Duncan. Welcome, John. What do you actually say in those moments we saw before the match there in the dressing rooms? Managers approach it in different ways. What do you do? Well, it was a bit different for us um, yesterday. We hadn't played for three weeks, so it really had to be a reminder on all the pattern and exactly what we, we tried to do in our system of play. So it was a repetition of that before the game. And did they do it? Pretty well, actually, yeah. We've got, we've got a system that we play to, and, and really everybody knows it. And at the minute, uh, they, they are doing it pretty well. Now, people say that whatever managers shout from the bench during the match, it does no good because nobody can hear them. But I've been to Chesterfield, and I, I, I've heard your voice from the back of the stand. I mean, is it important what you get across during your game? Well, maybe you hear it, but sometimes I think the players <laughs> don't hear it. Yeah, and a, a few players have spoken about Norton Lee kind of cutting the soap in half and <laughs> things like that. Was it? Is it easy as a manager, if, with like that relationship between manager and chairman? What's it like? Norton Lee was, 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 was difficult to work for, but he was supportive. Hmm. Um, you know, if you got beat, he wasn't on your back, or you, you, I mean, he didn't. A lot of managers, uh, owners sacked managers willy nilly. He didn't do that, you know. 
uh, he had a lot of things that I felt, you know, like most people did. He, he could have um, been been better at, but on the, these big crunch situations, he he was there and supported me through it, and uh, invariably backed me on on most of the decisions. Um, and what was your first impression in terms of what you needed to do to the squad when you came back in? Well, I had a good look at it and could see that it was wasn't going to knock any trees down. So I had to had to make moves. Um, trying to recall what, what happened in the well, we, we had a little run before the end of the season, which gave me a a little gift lift of who could who who could use. But in the end, we just we really had to change it pretty much right round. Went. Uh, Sean Deitch stayed. Um, the goalkeeper was good, McLennan, but he wanted to leave anyway. Um, that was about it. Um, there wasn't that many more. Well, Big Andy was around and he proved to be a big, big player for us. Um, so there were good, there was a couple of good players there for us, but we still had to build right around it. Mm. And it was interesting. We had um, Tom Curtis on the podcast and he was talking mm-hmm. about obviously doing his university studies at the same time and how he had to kind of juggle his week. That's so right. That was yeah. an interesting signing, wasn't it? Well, it was. It was, it was great for us because, you know, money was always tight and uh, Tom needed to go uh, or wanted to go to Loughborough, which was wise. Uh, and it gave us, he was going to sign for Burton part-time, but we jumped in and took them ourselves and turned out to be <laughs> fantastic signing, you know. Top, top just a few players, no doubt about that. And um and so that that first season, I think it was eighth, I think, 93, 94. Season. Was it? Yeah. Um, yeah. And like you said, second season, 94, 95 is the playoff winning season. Mm-hmm. Um I mean that unbeaten run is yeah. remarkable. Do you, yeah. do you find yourself getting quite superstitious when you keep winning? <laughs> uh, well, we did all right the first part of the season, but we just slipped a little bit. Um, and we made two signings, then we did it, we did it. Well, we made it, yeah, we signed Lormor and Robinson. And we also did swap deal for um, Tony Bryan, Nicky Law, and Jamie... Dave Moss for um, uh, Tony Bryan. Mm-hmm. Uh, and all those players that came to us came off and, and really helped us to go and move into another gear. And it worked out fantastically the second half of the season. Yeah. Was there a certain type of player that you thought you needed? Because I think I, when we were talking to Nicky Law, he was talking about how maybe... You needed someone like him that that would come in, who was kind of a personality or his mentality towards winning. Was there something you were really looking for? Well, yeah, I think that was fair enough. There was nobody that took on that role um, before he came, but I was fortunate as well. I signed um, Laurie Madden, who was a great signing for us. So we suddenly, from not having, you know, any real what would you say, stature and leadership at the back, um, we suddenly had Nicky Law and um, Laurie Madden. And Darren Carr also developed with them. Mm -hmm. And Lee Rogers as well, who I knew was a good player anyway. And we suddenly had a real solid backbone to the team that could allow us to go and play you know, three forwards, which was really fantastic for us in that in, at, at that point. Morris, lovely little flick. Here's Lorber. Shot! So, so sharp. Wonderful goal, Tony Lorber. That's why Tony Lorber has become a hero and a very quick favourite with the Chesterfield fans. The only sign for them in the new year. He's got 11 goals for them in this time. And that was absolutely razor sharp. And, and obviously, as Chesterfield manager, you've had a lot of Mansfield derbies. 
but it was yeah. probably, probably the biggest one at the end of that season. The bonkers game, wasn't it? Oh, yeah, that was the... I mean, that was a classic. I thought, actually, when we won that, that, that was it. We'd done enough, but woke up the next morning and realised I had to beat Berry in the final before we were clear. Um, no, uh, it was discipline, wasn't it, really? Which is what we had. You know, that's the other factor that I, I didn't mention before. You can't get booked. You can't get sent off. You don't go to ground and give penalties away. None of that. You stay on your feet. You no dissent, and nobody loses the temper. You know, you need you need eleven men on the pitch all the time, and that's what won it for us in that semi final. Um, we just kept calm under pressure, whereas they probably didn't. Yeah, and, and the and the final against Berry, you actually mm. changed it, didn't you? On the was it the morning? yeah? yeah. Um, well, Kevin Davis had been ill. And he played at Mansfield, but he didn't play in the return game, the second leg at Saltergate. Um, but he said he was all right, but he wasn't, well, had to make a decision. And I just felt the three up uh, and the three at the back, three defenders at the back, was just losing its sparkle a little bit, um, possibly through... The Kevin Davis not not being as energetic when he got ill, um, you know that type of thing. And I just felt that against the better teams, we may just struggle a little bit again with the three the three at the back and the three at the front. But it was a tough decision, you know. Kevin said to me, "Look, if you go and play a four four two against Berry, they've played it all season. Why are you, why are you going to be better than them?" And it was, a, it, was, it was a good argument. But I did feel that the, the three at the back had lost its impetus one for one reason or another. And I changed it, yeah. Changed it. Well, we changed it in the, the two game, the semi-final, second leg in the final. Mm. Although it was, it was a tough call for the final. Because Davis was fit again, you know. Yeah, and, and that shows a lot of belief in your players, doesn't it? That you can you can go to them and say, right, we're changing it, and to trust them to then, you know, click it. Yeah, but, we, you know, we did work on it. And, I, I mean, I remember working on the two systems. Well, we knew the three at the back anyway by that time, but I worked on the, the four at the back uh, as well. Um, but I didn't actually make a decision until the, the Saturday morning. It was uh, It was a late call on it. And, and some goals from long throws in that match. We've had a bit of a long throw renaissance recently, even all the like the big yeah the big teams, teams and all that are doing it now. Yeah, we used to get stick for doing it. Um, Nicky was good at it. Yeah, and we had a wee system where we had players going in in the right a direction, and Nick Nick two goals in the final of it. Yeah, yeah, and it, even at Chesterfield now we're we're on onto the long throws again with George Carline. He can really throw him in the box. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So then you started to, in like the season after we got promoted, we started to um, kind of build that team that would then uh, play in the FA Cup run in the well, season after. I was, I was determined I would do better on the transition from the fourth to the third this time than I did the last time. I felt I personally could have done better on that. And yeah, we really moved on and... Fortunately, you've got Davis coming in, which helps, you know, and um, Davis, Lormer, uh, Morris up front was formidable. And we've got a system worked out how, how we could make sure that that was our, our, our way and that we could get the ball into the right areas. And, and really that season, we knocked teams over by half time quite regularly in, at home games. And we're right in there. Right, right up there, and very close for most of the season. As, as a as a striker yourself, did you have any? You've had loads of really great strikers during your time at Chesterfield. Were there any that you really that you really liked? I liked all. I like I liked I like Bob Newton and the way he could hold the ball, and yet you know he, his strength was actually to go and run in behind. 
And I liked the way he did that and gathered the ball. And he was also technically a good finisher when he got himself a chance. And obviously I loved um, Ernie Moss, who was didn't need me to tell him anything. Um, was going to get was going to get his share of goals, mm. but was equally effective at the other end of the pitch. So they were like different class. Um, then into the next t- team, um, the emerging Davis was you know fantastic. That uh, a young boy could come on and. You know, give him his head, and he and he and he he scored quite a few goals actually, which people maybe don't recall. Mm. And Tony Lorimer run all day and scored goals, and great team player as well. Um, and Andy Morris for, you know, what a target! In fact, he was better on the deck. He was good on the deck. People don't seem to realise that how mm. how big a good a touch he had, and he was a great partner for those two lads. Did you ever get your boots on in training and kind of show them how it's done? I didn't want to show them up too much, so I didn't do that very often. <laughs> and and then we should go on, I suppose, FA Cup run. So uh, it's 25 years, I think, uh, next next year. It'll be mm-hmm. the 25th anniversary. Um, obviously, what point did you think, oh, there's something, something happening here? Because we didn't have many cup runs, did we? Uh, but if you look at all, if you look at the programmes... From the FA Cup, I said, Wembley, here we come, right from the start. <laughs> but I just got that wrong. Um, no, I had a feeling we'd have a good cup run. A, we hadn't done particularly well in the cup. And B, we had a team that, you know, nobody, we're not going to lie down anywhere here. Um, and we had pace and power to score. So, you know, it wasn't a shock if, if, if we won... You know, you don't win every week, but it wasn't a surprise that we were doing well. Mm. Yeah, and obviously a lot of home draws as well. So the, the yeah, draws, so we got that. Draws, was, that was a big help because Saltergate, not many teams liked it, and we knew it and suited us. Yeah, were there, were there any matches in that run apart from the kind of semi final that you looked at that you were because obviously the 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 Kevin Davies hat trick at Bolton was was huge and. Uh, and I, I really remember the Nottingham Forest match. Were, were there any that stood out for you that were that you really really enjoyed? Well, but, I don't know if I enjoyed it. Berry was the toughest. They, they 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 came closest to causing us a problem, and they were a real strong team, not just not, not similar to ourselves. Um, uh, Mark Williams scored a, a header at a corner, but the last ten minutes we just survived it. You know, it was a Clinging on, and um, it was a great, great victory. Uh, so that was a that was a big game for us. But yeah, yeah, as you say, you know the three at the three at um, Bolton for Kev was magnificent, uh, and we played well. Forest really dominated the game. I mean, there was no luck in that one. Um, and we had all the changes that we had to make to. For the Wrexham game, I think Davis was out. Somebody else was out. Was it Dan Carr? They'd both been sent off the week before, or whatever it was. Uh, and somebody else was struggling. So it was a, wasn't our strongest team that was out there. But we hung on, and what a finish by Beaumont, who probably got underrated as a player. Wrexham's run started at Little Colwyn Bay. Indeed, Wrexham were very close to going out. And here is Beaumont now, and Beaumont might just get in here. He has done, and Chesterfield are in the lead. Oh, what an atmosphere here now at Saltergate. Chris Beaumont is the hero of the moment for those supporters. Yeah, and you mentioned that the Battle of Saltergate, as, as as they call it now, where we had the two players sent off. Yeah. In between the, the Forest and the Wrexham games, wasn't it? Yeah. I mean, and you talked about discipline, just a bit. Yeah. It's not using discipline. What When you're on the sidelines and something like that kicks off, what are you, what are you thinking? 
<laughs> well, I was thinking, look, we've got to get in there and calm them down. But Kev said, hey, sit down. You know, there's enough going on out of there without us getting involved. And he was right. And yeah, I said discipline, but those two lads didn't at that point. But we were really provoked. I mean, it was they came and kicked us off the pitch, which I don't blame them for. They couldn't take us on and they needed the points. And they played a real tough, hard game against us that day, Plymouth. And probably deserved to beat us. And it just all sprung up, you know, I suppose you know, backing each other up type of thing was what they did and it just went the wrong way. Yeah. I but we still won, still beat Wrexham, so yeah. who knows what would have happened if we'd had them all out there. Exactly. And and going on to the, like, did you notice as the run went on, I suppose media interest started to get bigger, didn't sure. it? You have more people at the press conferences and yeah, like that. Was it, was that a, a strange thing to manage? Um... It became that, yeah, because, you know, there was a, what a bit of a committee and because it got to that point, there was so much going on, um, players committee and, um, yeah, I mean, I, I, but we were still hard working, good, good guys, you know, they weren't, they didn't get carried away with it and they kept producing the performances in the league as well, we did pretty well. Just missed out on the playoffs. Um, so it was difficult, but it was enjoyable. Um, it's the biggest thing of all was to see the town, the reaction of the town, and all the cars with the stickers and people queuing up for tickets. And uh, the fact that we'd affected so many people's lives by what we'd done. Um, that was before we got to Old Trafford. was um was fantastic. God, yeah, I mean... All the shop windows and things like that were yeah. all created, weren't they? Yeah. You know, it must it must give you an, an immense sense of pride, like at the time and even looking back, that you were kind of manager of something like that. Yeah, to, 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 to be able to have affected people's lives in such a positive manner over that three month period or whatever it was 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 really something special. Mm. So so going into the Middlesbrough match, how do you how do you plan? when you're coming up against Janino and Ravenelli and <laughs> people like that? Well, with, with two plans, we? with the, with the plan to mark Janino man for man with Josie, or we just stuck to the back four that we had and, um, you know, tried to pass them on and deal with them in, in, in that way. Um, so that was the, the two shapes that we had. Um, and we used them both <laughs> in the match. We started with the back four, but it didn't take long to work out that we better get a hold of this Janino a bit more than we were. So we went into the second option, if you like. Mm. And and we had um, Tom Curtis on. He was talking about how um, when when the penalty was awarded, and he <laughs> picked the ball up and he heard you <laughs> shouting, "Dice!" Was that was that something that? Um, Straight away, you thought, Dash has got to have the ball for this one. <laughs> yeah, well, I didn't want to tell anybody. Tom had taken them, but he'd missed a couple. He got the big one against Forrest, obviously. Mm. But, um, and I didn't want to say to anybody before the match who was taken it. I thought that would be too big a burden for somebody to have. So I didn't, we didn't decide that. But I knew who it was going to be, but... Uh, I just uh, relayed it on when when the penalty was given. Is it it's one just, of those things where you just thought them being captain and the yeah mentality of him and the guy he, you know he, he was the guy who could take the responsibility and I was certain he would score, which was stupid because you know anybody can miss a penalty, but um, well he did he scored. Hmm. Yeah, on that, I'll, I love that clip of the of it just because you can hear the thump as he hits the ball. Um, <laughs> absolutely magnificent. Still Morris, this terrific play brought down. David Ellery thinks and gives Chesterfield the penalty kick. And I was talking to John Duncan an hour before the kickoff. He says we haven't got a penalty taken. Well, they have no. He 
shouting Deitch, I think. He's shouting to the captain. They're all looking at each other. Come on. To the captain. Well, if you're not sure, lad, the only ones I can offer that, just smash it. Sean Dyche. He smashed it all right. Chesterfield lead. Middlesbrough by two goals to nil. And, and obviously we should mention, like, the disallowed goal and... Yeah. And things like that. I mean, is that something you still look back on kind of every now and then? Well, I suppose you get less and less, but... Uh... You never, we, you, we all think it um, the goal should have been given. But the other side of it is if we'd got to Wembley, I mean, that build up to Wembley would have been a killer. You know? <laughs> been, I don't know, I'd be worrying just about as much about getting a hammer as about winning it, obviously. Um, but it would have been a great experience to, to, to have felt if we had made it. Yeah. Did you did you watch the final or were you on the were you on the holiday or we were on holiday, yeah. We didn't really want nobody was really that interested in it. Um well, what was it, Middles? Uh Chelsea scored in the first minute, didn't they? Yeah, I mean we wouldn't have let a goal in, in the first minute. No, uh, unlikely. No chance. <laughs> 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 and um and then what was it what was it like after that whole run? Because obviously loads of people got, got moves, didn't they, on, on the back of that? So it, Well, that's the other thing, you know. And by that time, you know, when you're a manager, you, you try to keep your best players and get them on contract. And the last thing you want to do is see them going out the door. And I'd done that with that team for a couple of seasons. And but when they've done so well in the cup like that, um and the big money is likely to come their way. As much as I don't want to lose them, I, I could, un, uh, you know, I could understand why they would have to go and try and, because these guys weren't rich. These guys were just ordinary people. Didn't have, he had a few bob, I suppose, but nothing to, to write home about. So it would have been wrong for Davis not to go and make money. Deitch, Curtis, Williams. Mercer, Holland, you know, it, it would have been wrong, uh, if, especially if we, we couldn't match the, the payments that they would, they would likely get. So I didn't really want to stand in their way mm. um, because of what they'd done and given to the club anyway. Yeah. And, and, the, um, and that cup run, do you think without a cup run, We'd have stood a good chance of promotion that season because the fixtures congested up a bit, didn't they? Yeah, I suppose. I think we probably would have done. Maybe next, we'd have got into the play. Would it? Yeah, we'd have got in the playoffs. I think. Um, but by the time we hit the quarterfinals, you know that the cup took pre- the, top, the cup did take precedence. Mm. We just had to do it that way and hoped that. Maybe we would pick up enough wins in the league, but we had to prepare. Curtis got injured um, and just made the semi and no more, I think it was. Um, And there was a few situations like that where we just couldn't risk playing a player in the the league game. Yeah. Yeah. Um, So the league became secondary and just didn't quite make it. Do you think that... Nowadays, a club of the same kind of level could could reach an FA Cup semi final. Um, it's probably unlikely, isn't it, these days? Because it's the top of the table, the top of the Premier League is so so world class now. Mm. Um, but the standards in the lower leagues are higher as well. I don't, I don't think they'd make the pair. They might sneak in. You might nick in the quarters or. The, Semis, I think, at the very best. Yeah, yeah. It's, don't stop everyone believing, does it? <laughs> no, <laughs> there, yeah. no, no. <laughs> and um, and then yeah. It, so then you had you were still with Chesterfield, obviously until two thousand, weren't you? And there was loads of. I mean, I loved uh, that was when I kind of really started watching Chesterfield, and I, I totally loved Steve Blatherwick and David Reeves and people yeah. like that, magnificent players. Um, we kind of did have a go, didn't we? We came ninth, I think, the season after. Yeah, we didn't do too bad. I think I had a run of about three or four seasons. I think we were in the top, top ten the whole time. So, um, but, you know, it was hard to 
get us players as good as the ones that we'd had previously. Now you've mentioned a couple of lads there. Marcus said Ebden was as good as anybody. That was a, mm-hmm. but it was really difficult to to fill the gaps, and I had to fill a lot of gaps pretty quickly. Um, and gradually, the finances has changed. Um, the was it Dan Brown took over as well, so there was um, change in that area. And he had his own thoughts and his own ways. And to be fair, I probably had done my time as well. You know, I'd, uh, as much as I was still doing my best, I was probably not just quite as sharp and as decisive as, a, as I was as a manager previously. And, and Nicky Law said that you were great to him when he got the job. Um, yeah. I suppose that's, is that something you wanted to see it? You, you, you were... Did you have faith in him as going on to being a manager? Did you sing that in him as a player? Um, well, definitely. You know, he was a clever lad. He was a good leader. and um, He can make decisions. Um, so I think he was a logical, logical choice, to be fair. Um, but no, no, yeah. I mean, he's another one who'd done so much. I wanted him to stay at the club, actually, but I told him he wouldn't be first choice. You know, Dykes, Williams, Carr would 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 be ahead of him. Um, but uh, but I wanted him to stay. But he wanted to play, and he went went non league actually. Mm. But then we brought him back in as a community officer, and he was working in the club at that time, which we were pleased to have him back in. And, and one thing I wanted to, we're getting near the end, but one thing I wanted to ask about was just um, having a testimonial, <laughs> which is amazing. Not many managers get a testimonial, do they? It's... No, we've done 10 years, haven't we, all together at least. Um, but then, remember, the club had gone into administration and gone broke by then. So both Kevin and I, were our contracts were not, upheld at that time so we 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 didn't get paid we, we eventually got a, uh, a payment but nothing and nothing like as as uh, equal to the contract that we'd signed so it was really in lieu of that and we were delighted with the guy who is it who is it so what's his name i can't get his name out who actually got it through for us um Good guy. Um, he was part of the supporters' trust. He led that. Um, and, yeah, it was good. Man United came over and Sir Alec did, did us a favour and sent over quite a few of his top players. I was going to say, I mean, we lost lost 5-0, but <laughs> like the goal scorers were Lauren Blanc and Ruud van Nistelrooy and Roy Keane, I think, scored as well. I mean, yeah. They did bring a stellar team, didn't they? yeah. Oh, fantastic, yeah. Do you look back on management now and, and miss it, or are you? No, 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 no. Well, I had enough, I had enough of that. <laughs> was the... Look what look it's turned me into, you know. Yeah. <laughs> and, and finally, obviously there's the, the title win in 84-85 and the playoff win um, in 94-95 and then the FA Cup semi-final. Is, is there anything that kind of sits top of the tree for you, or is it hard to pick? Oh, I think it's the, the semi-final and the cup run is top of the tree. I don't think you can really deny that. But to be champions was immense at that time in my career. First real big success, if you like. And the playoff run, that run that took us right through there, it was special. Mm. Uh, and the way that we did it, scoring, scored the goals with the front three, David Moss, not mentioned too much about him. Lorimer and um, Davis up, up there was oof, phenomenal for that second part of the season. Um, but you've got to go with the cup, I think, because the overriding good feeling and memory that you that I have and I think all the players that were involved did as well. Yeah. And, and final question, when, when the glasses went flying, <laughs> were they your glasses? 
They it went turned out no, but you wouldn't believe it. Somehow or other, in the bloody cup semi final, I'd, I'd either left the, my glasses in the car or something, and we were in, and they discovered it in the on the bus on the way to Old Trafford. Um, but Kevin' eyes were similar to mine on the defect, and so I, I borrowed his spare pair, and it was them that went flying. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> So yeah. that was a that was a moment, yeah. <laughs> we were doing the wrong thing there, actually, as it turned out. You know, we must have had a minute left to go, didn't it? And we really, you know, I said, "Oh God, brilliant!" Right? Like, you know, steady down. We really should just have stayed stayed forward with everybody and uh, been a better chance of winning four three in that last minute than than we had in the replay. But easier said than done now. Crikey, can you imagine if we'd have won 4-3 on that? <laughs> oh, <my. laughs> Beaumont. Good early cross. Very good early cross. Kiewit! Jamie Kiewit! The lad from Chesterfield has equalised for Chesterfield in the 119th minute. Well, you could not in a million years have envisaged a match like this between sides as Sean Duncan even loses his glasses in the jubilation nil nil at half time 2-2 two, two at regulation time 3-2 halfway through extra time and in the nick of time Jamie Hewitt keeps Chesterfield in the FA Cup.